Oh, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good chance to get some questions from investors and have some conversations. Keep in mind, it's not just about meeting investors, but all of you here are great founders, so there's great opportunities for peer networking. So um, let's go to the position where we're at a mall and we're looking at the map and wondering, where are we? Well, for those of you that forgot that you are here, you're in part two of the presentation. So these are companies that are in property and cash and they're going to be doing five minute presentations to share with you about their business. So I'm going to bring up our first company, Measure One. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. My name is Ilan Amir. I'm the CEO at Measure One. If we look at the insurance industry today, document friction is everywhere. PDFs are flying, images of PDFs, PDFs of images of, of PDFs, quoting, verification, underwriting. I was trying to find a picture where somebody was just standing underneath a mountain of documents, but that's sometimes what the whole process feels like. And of course, the entire process is reliant on public and self-reported data on top of everything else. Fortunately, there's a solution to this problem, and it comes from an emerging workflow called consumer permission data. Consumer permission data is the sharing of data that is in consumer accounts with requesting businesses. If you've connected your bank account to Venmo, you've used consumer permission data. If you've connected your brokerage account to TurboTax, you've used consumer permission data. You've connected your bank account to PayPal, you've used consumer permission data. Here's the secret. That's not such a secret. Consumer data and most consumer data is already in online accounts. The consumer can share it if there's a way to connect those accounts to the requesting business. From a business standpoint, of course, it vastly broadens the amount of data that a business can get access to. And of course, the provenance of the data is then guaranteed because it's going straight from the data source to the business. This is where Measure One comes in. Measure One has built the first platform that enables businesses to embed consumer permission data into their workflows. It's a complete solution for using consumer permission data in business workflows. Enables consumers to share their data through Measure One with those businesses. We don't care what the data is. It can be pay stubs, it can be insurance policies, it can be academic transcripts, it can be income, employment data. Any type of data can be shared through Measure One. We have unmatched coverage. I'll show you in a couple slides of what we cover across multiple domains and we are continuing adding new domains and new document types. This is how it works. An insurance provider or agency is asking a consumer to share some data with them. The consumer, through our integration with the provider, ends up on our service. We engage with the consumer to identify where the data would sit. The consumer shares their credentials with us, gives us the authority and the consent to share that data with the provider. We then grab the data, digitize it, and deliver it back to the insurance provider. This whole process takes from a consumer standpoint, takes about 30 seconds to a minute, and the insurance provider has data that is directly from the data source as if they had a direct API to that consumer's data. We cover 100% of US employees for income and employment. We have over 10,000 data sources across multiple industries, and we add probably about 50 to 100 data sources a day. To do that, you obviously have to have a pretty rich tech stack to be able to uh, automate the addition of data sources and the addition of all the types of documents that we see on a regular basis. Uh, we cover 95% of insurance providers. We cover over 4,000 payroll processors. And we are entering into new markets where we will also have this type of coverage. Our go-to-market is to four main segments, background screening companies, lenders, insurance agencies and carriers, and marketing companies. Our revenue model is transactional, and we have some fixed plans for smaller customers, and we engage directly with the end customer or through platforms that ultimately take us to the consumers of those customers. You can see the sample use cases here on the right. I highlighted the insurance ones. Uh, we sell outside of insurance as well, uh, but you can see the insurance verification, quoting, underwriting, employment and income verification, credit decisioning, and other use cases as well. In the insurance market, 
we're focused on three areas, distribution first, enabling policyholders to easily share their policies with agents and brokers, verification in the lending space for mortgages and auto lending, and for underwriting, enabling the access to data that can better underwriting on the personal side, income employment, and alternative consumer data. And we're also getting a lot of interest on the, on the commercial side, whose biggest problem is that we might have to change the name a little bit from consumer permissioned to corporate permissioned as well. Uh, but on the commercial side, gaining access to payroll logs, accounting details uh, for commercial uh, underwriting, insurance underwriting as well. We've got over 100 signed customers across multiple industries. We just entered into the insurance market about 90 days ago. We're cur our current focus is the solution for distribution, but as I mentioned, we're already starting to get pulled into directions outside of our initial focus. We have our first customers signed up and are in talks with several carriers. We are expanding into new domains and use cases, and we love engaging with new markets because we learn about them and then we can understand the data needs of that market. Our ask is, obviously, first and foremost, business development. If you're interested in this, if you're interested in consumer permission data in your business, I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to know about it and, and we'd love to work with you. And we will be raising our first institutional round next quarter. So to the investment community, if you're interested in this space, please come see me. Any other information or questions, come see me. I'll be here for the next few hours. And of course, that's my direct contact info. Please send me an email. Thank you. For this next one, I want you to think about how you got here. Some of you took a plane, some of you took a train, maybe some took a bus, but the crazy ones probably rented a car and drove here. But you're probably asking yourself, you know, if I drove here, am I protected? Well, Steve with Pablo is going to help answer that question and show you some options that you can consider. Thanks, David. Hello, everybody. Steve Sherlock's my name. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pablo Inc. And our main product in the market is called Bonza. And in Australia, we say Bonza, mate. <laughs> Sorry. So just to give you uh, an indication of, of what's happened in the market. For example, during the pandemic, the car rental companies shrunk by basically 50%. So in the wake of, of that shrinking, a new breed of entrepreneurs started to provide new car rental models that exceed some of the uh, difficulties that car rental companies have. So for example, the car rental companies, the biggest problem that they have these independent car rental companies is that they don't have, they're not licensed, they don't have any uh, insurance of, for their customers, so they end up uh, not being able to take reservations. So someone might come to a depot if they don't have insurance, and these independent companies don't have insurance as well, then they can't uh, do a transaction. And additionally, uh, predominantly, what they're uh, lacking is embedded insurance. So the solution effectively is by our company providing these car rental companies. We have about 30 car rental companies that we support already. And by providing a API feed into those car rental companies means that they don't need to be licensed because the feed that we provide is going to um, uh, cover those folks. As far as mitigation goes, we're in the process of creating a DMV process where we can validate what someone's driver's history is and also facial recognition. Now this is an interesting model, uh, Halo Car, which we are working with now. It's what they're basically doing is imagine that they're sitting in their depot and they drive, so they got someone sitting in the depot and they're driving the car remotely. So let's say your hotel, you're waiting for someone to, for the car to come and 
when the car arrives, you jump in the car. But what they're doing is they're driving autonomously the vehicle to you to pick it up. And so that's a, a really interesting model. And these are some of the nuances in this car rental industry that's changing now as a result. And Halo Car, we're the provider of the insurance for them. As well, uh, Jules, we have started to work with as well. And predominantly the companies we're working with are uh, electric vehicles. Uh, this company out of Phoenix, Arizona, we're actually doing an embedded process with them right now. And this is interesting. There's aggregation companies, uh, car rental aggregators. And right now only, uh, so in this case, Allianz provides damage insurance for these companies. But what we've found is we sell over 50% of all of our insurances are liability. So if you don't have your own car or you don't have your own liability, that's where we're able to fill that gap. So we make money by selling the insurance. We don't actually pay anything to the car rental companies. They are getting that service basically for free. Um, our API, we probably won't charge a fee. We'll just make that uh, free. And uh, our We've sold about $1.2 million in a premium this year, and our loss ratio is uh, only 25%. So that's our uh, growth so far. And we've really only just started because we've got, uh, once we've um, Once we've started to create this, uh, so many companies, uh, car rental companies, that they are seeking access to the type of insurance that, that we're providing. So that's uh, basically uh, helping us grow quickly. The market is going to double between now and 2030. Uh, we're a team of three and we have some uh, smart looking advisors. All right, thanks. Thanks, Steve. So next up, you do a lot in, in the world thinking about what's coming in through your eyes, watching these presentations, what you're hearing through your ears, but what you might not be thinking about is what you're feeling through your hands and the people that prepare you food, what they're doing. So Danny from PathSpot's going to enlighten you to the universe of pathogens. Thank you, David. Just an impeccable intro all day long today. Um, so my name is Danny Shragi. I'm with PathSpot Technologies. As he mentioned, I have a prop, which is a little bit of a cheat code here. Um, but uh, so we are a, uh, thank you, a proactive prevention uh, system, primarily serving uh, food service and food manufacturing right now. Um, looking today for uh, conversations with carriers, MGAs, brokers on strategic partnerships. Before we get into all of that, um, I wanted to share a photo of myself from about 15 years ago. Um, I was serving up some barbecue uh, at a meat market and to the good people of Detroit. Um, and if you've ever worked in retail, um, you know just how thin of a line there is between a good day and, frankly, catastrophe. Um, and there is not a lot that is setting 17-year-old Danny up for success here. <laughs> um, so when you think about it, the number one way that outbreaks happen in restaurants is from poor hand washing. Nine out of ten times, poor hand washing is what makes somebody sick. The best that we've done is a sign on the wall in the bathroom. Um, spoilage control, right? These operations have dozens and dozens of hot and cold units, and we're relying on analog thermometers that people might check to see, you know, it only takes a couple hours for bacteria to begin growing, um, and this is what we rely on. You know, training opportunities, a lot of it is watch and learn, analog task management. I, I can tell you that, you know, at the end of a day, I would go through a checklist and check it all off. 
Um, and at the end of the day, it, it, it causes all of the things, I mean, basic maintenance on fryers, right? Everything that I just pointed to is directly causing loss for um, not just the restaurant and the consumers, but also for anybody that provides these lines. Um, so PathSpot's solution is, as I mentioned, focus on proactive prevention in this industry. Um, and I uh, am actually going to use one of David's ideas. Um, David's sending up a different guinea pig. So Roy, if you don't mind coming up here. Um, <laughs> so uh, Roy's going to demonstrate the use of the hand scanner. He's going to stick his hands underneath, palms up, both of them, both hands. Get close enough. I think the light might be messing with you. Okay. So right now he's scanning his hands. Usually food workers scan after a wash and dry. It's going to tell you to flip them over. And try it one more time. I think the light's messing with you. <laughs> All right. All right. The demo might be might be failing here. I apologize. We're, we'll we'll get to that. We'll try it one more time at the end, Roy, if you don't mind hanging around. Um, but so um, this is solvable, and we have, uh, in addition to instant quality checks, we have data. Um, that we use to help quality and operations teams uh, focus on frequency and quality of hand washing and get uh, visibility into the riskiest uh, parts of facilities in their operation. Um, you can see some nasty hands. What we, the data that we get is absolutely disgusting. Um, and, and recently, we've expanded our infrastructure to include different claims drivers as well. Um, so we have the hand washing tool. We have a task management tool so that requires photo validation that doesn't set 17-year-old Danny, 17 Danny up to be able to cheat the system. We have food labeling uh, technology that's focused on uh, mitigating spoilage and temperature control sensors that send instant SMS alerts and escalate them up the chain to handle refrigeration units that go out. So why am I here? Um, I think that there's a, a very natural um, synergy with anybody that provides product spoilage, uh, liability um, lines. Right, we have um, these sensors that go in the refrigeration hot and cold units, send alerts. We're going to improve your loss ratio. Um, when it comes time for renewal conversations, instead of just talking about your premium cost, um, why not bring to them the the impact that you've had on their hand washing and other uh, safety items? Um, so we'll help you improve your NPS. Uh, and frankly, the restaurant industry is moving in this direction. They want these tools. Um, they improve their efficiency, believe it or not, um, and their reputation is the one that's at stake. Um, so especially in the post-COVID world, our brands are using this and, and you know, the hand-washing tool and others as a marketing tactic. Um, and you, know, you could be the one to bring that to them. So um, as of right now, we are the only solution that does all of this together. Um, digital task management, um, temperature sensors, and hand-washing all together. Um, and I'd really like to, to have some conversations, might not be you, but maybe with your LPs, anybody that's a carrier, uh, a broker, or an MGA that services these industries, uh, would love to talk more. I'll also uh, get that unit working out in the, uh, in the hallway if you want to come check your hands and see if you have any contamination. So thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. So I think next time when you're thinking about you know, going out and getting something from one of the carts on the street, you might want to just peer in and see, you know, do they have a nice sink? Does it look like it was used recently? And that might give you a little bit of assurance, but hopefully you can convince them to get a path spot so that way you can be very assured. So with our next presenter, it's a little more of a solemn topic these days in the crypto space. I mean, we're living in a unique time with the collapse of Alameda and FTX, but I think one of the things that probably a lot of you thought last week when all this was happening is, you know, where am I storing my crypto? Or more importantly, where did I put all of my apes that I bought from the NFT marketplace? So Maggie's going to be here talking to you about how to keep those safe and what she's doing about it. Thanks, David. Okay. All right. So... Am I going in the right direction? Okay, great. So uh, my name is Maggie McInnes. I am the founder of Possum Insurance. Um, Possum is an MGA that insures non-fungible tokens, which are commonly called NFTs. 
Uh, we protect customers against theft and loss of the NFT, which uh, primarily occurs through phishing. Um, so the asset class has grown from virtually zero in 2018 to over $40 billion. Um, now, existing lines of business do not cover NFTs and are not designed to cover them. Um, in order for an NFT insurance policy to work, the insurance company needs to be able to have visibility into the insured's custody arrangements. Uh, the insurance company also needs to be able to account for fluctuations in the value of the NFT and adjust premiums accordingly. Current homeowners, fine arts, and cyber policies do not allow for this. Possum has an escrow-like custody arrangement with its users, allowing us to have full visibility into the movements of the assets, dramatically reducing the potential both for, number one, the users to be defrauded by hackers, and number two, for the users to defraud Possum. The policy does not go into effect until the asset is deposited in a special Possum-approved multi-signature wallet. So we are making conservative assumptions about growth because it's not possible to rely on past trends which show virtually exponential growth in the size of the asset class. But even with conservative assumptions, we can see our way clear to $20 million in revenue or in premiums in 24 months and probably a little over 70 million in five years. This is a totally untapped market for all intents and purposes. Um, several businesses are building products that are adjacent to ours. None are pursuing the same segment or growth strategy. Many of them are not regulated insurance products, but are more like cover pools, in some cases backed by DeFi protocols. These will not be able to scale. Um, so this is a quick slide breaking down where every dollar of premium is going. We plan to charge between 1% and 2% of asset value annually in premium. Uh, this is aligned with premiums paid for fine art and jewelry policies. So our underwriting is based on historical losses, which assume there is no security in place to protect the asset. Uh, however, we intend to require our customers to implement very strict security policies, uh, meaning our underwriting is extremely conservative compared to what we actually think our losses will look like. And this means we may have higher margins than predicted, uh, but we, you know, we want to err on the side of caution. So we have tried to tee up a list of clients who will be good partners to pilot the program so that we can hit the ground running and get good feedback, detailed underwriting validation, and reliable revenues on day one of launch. So just a brief recap. We do not insure against the value of the NFT decreasing. We do not insure against system-wide hacks, meaning we are not cat exposed. So that's really important. Um, and just a little bit of background on the team. Um, I'm a former M&A lawyer. I specialized in doing insurance deals at a law firm called Deb Bavoys and Plimpton. Uh, and I graduated from Columbia Law School. My team draws somewhat from the traditional finance and crypto worlds, but mainly consists of veteran insurance industry professionals. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. So I wanted to sort of contextualize our product in the context of recent news about the uh, collapse of the of one of the biggest uh, crypto exchanges which is called, was called FTX um, which filed for bankruptcy a couple days ago so um, you know I, I hate to say this because it was a horrible situation and a lot of innocent people lost a ton of money but in in some ways it could be good news for possum um, in fact I, I actually strongly believe it's good news for possum um, the industry is, is likely to move toward self-custody given the kind of corrosion and trust in centralized exchanges. And insurance plays a much more important role when uh, users are self-custodying their assets. So NFTs have always been self-custodial, which is why we started with NFT insurance because we, we anticipate the, a very low likelihood of NFTs moving toward a, a centralized custody solution. but. Now, um, kind of given the current climate, it's, it's likely that other assets, uh, a large subset of other assets will kind of move toward a self-custodial model, in which case insurance actually may be necessary, um, not just for NFTs, but, but for the, the larger kind of crypto asset ecosystem. So that's kind of a, a phase two thing, but it's just, you know, important to kind of understand 
the role that this product plays given, um, given recent events. All right, thanks Maggie. Next up is Yuria with ProtoShare. Hello, I'm Maria. I'm the CEO of ProtoShare. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our company and maybe ways you could um, we could work together. All right. So a little background. Um, as you know, the insurance space is very complex, especially PNC insurance. There's thousands of different product lines. If you really get into the nitty gritty of it, and to launch a new PNC product, especially if it's not some a standardized product, takes a really long time. Uh, typical numbers that float around are 12, 18, 24 months, millions of dollars. And so what the industry really desperately needs is something that other industries have, a quick way to bring a, something to market, right? To get feedback, to understand whether it's a good product or not, and to finally deliver that product to, to consumers. So what we do is we built an entirely new platform that allows you to uh, build and distribute complex PNC insurance products at extremely low cost in days without writing a single line of code. So most insurance products remain supporting an antiquated technology. Um, many of them are... Uh, because there's so many, it's such a diverse ecosystem of PNC insurance products, um, it becomes very difficult to maintain and support those kind of um, more specialized types of insurance products. We call it the 80-20 problem. 80% 80 of the revenue in the insurance industry is concentrated in about 20% of the product lines. So what are the other 20, uh, 80 per, what are the other 20% of revenue, 80% of product lines, how do they get maintained? So that's very difficult to actually support those types of systems. Another issue is that quite a lot of the insurance industry, it's a little bit of a dirty secret, is still really primarily supported by spreadsheets. Um, you, if you're trying to qu quickly get an MGA up and running, you'd be surprised how many of them are just literally people sitting at workstations, um, cutting and pasting the spreadsheets, manually putting together documents, et cetera. Um, and so that you find that in the smallest MGAs and then actually the largest insurance companies, probably in fact slightly more in largest insurance companies than the smallest MGAs. And the last part is some companies just have so much of their core technologies into systems that are 20, 30, 40 years old and need some ability to cost effectively modernize them. Not replace, rip and replace, but put something on top of it that allows them to be competitive with newer entrants in the market. So what we do is we enable non-programmers. So we're talking about actuaries, business analysts, uh, subject matter experts within the insurance company to develop and digitally distribute those products and connect to core systems if they need to connect to a core system or use standalone if they need, want to use it standalone. And so some of the aspects of what we really specialize in is one, you actually build the product on ProtoSure. So what that means is the rates, the forms, the business logic, the third party API integration, um, all the document generation, the reporting, et cetera. So you actually build the entire complex insurance product with all the different versioning, all the different ways you have to manage a complex product in a, in a 50 plus, you know, 50 state plus multiple other jurisdictions within the United States. And you are able to build the front end, the back end, and, and, as, and all the components in between. Um, and all that can be built you, literally with just having a moderate to advanced knowledge of Excel. Um, we really built our system around um, advanced Excel users and being able to take collateral they already have like spreadsheets and being able to repurpose it so you could actually build an entire system around that. So once you build a product on ProtoSure and manage it and iterate on it, um, then the next step is how do you distribute it? So many systems, that they, they consider themselves done once the actual system is implemented. And, and distribution is really another system or a, another team of engineers or web designers to build some distribution models for that system. What we do is once you build it on our system, we provide no code tools to, to, for you to distribute it either on your own sites internally or most interestingly with perhaps hundreds or thousands of different partners that have very simple technical uh, capabilities. So if you want to say, how can I replace my advertising campaigns on a thousand WordPress sites with actual rate quote bind capabilities with those same sites and partners, we have, a, we have the ability to give that to you without any programming required. And the last part is that once you have all the data in the system, you want to be able to utilize it in some, in some fashion. So how do you report and manage that data? Most systems that requires a DBA, very complex processes to get the schemas out and be able to manage them, especially as they change over time. We provide no code tools for you to get access to every single piece of information that the system has ever been exposed to. So when you have a self-service model like this, you're really minimizing the bottlenecks that, that, are, that are typically uh, required for launching new insurance products. So instead of a business team having to go through IT to be able to work with sales teams and different partners and whatnot, 
the business team and the, and the internal subject matter experts within the insurance company could collaborate with those, third, those parties directly. So a little bit about just a kind of a summary of some of our capabilities. Um, these, these are uh, the capabilities we could do. This is how we work with the different ecosystem within the insurance industry, whether it's third-party APIs to enrich your data, to be able to distribute through third parties, um, to be able to use tools and collateral that you already have uh, and different types of artifacts you already have within your insurance company or MGA, that we, we provide the, the central hub for you to be able to implement all that. So we enable the integration of all those product configuration steps from product creation to policy issuance. You build a product within our systems. That's typically where you start. You design the front end. You, design, you, you implement the underwriting rules, connect the rating system, either internally as a spreadsheet or a third-party API, or upload your own code if you like, and implement all the documentation, distribute it, and then you report and analyze it. Some additional use cases that are a little bit interesting is that um, the industry doesn't really have any prototyping and R&D tools. If you want to build an insurance product, you're li literally just using Microsoft Office tools. So with our, with our platform, you could before you actually make that big investment decision, you could actually design it internally, have it as something that's, that could be shared with other stakeholders, and then you can decide whether it's a go, no-go situation. You could also give this as, as a tool for, uh, for agents to give them additional tools so they could distribute digitally, embedded insurance, and legacy modernization. Oh, Yuri, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap. I'm wrapping it up. Um, some success stories. Um, I guess I'm a little bit loquacious. Um, we'll keep going. And what are we looking for? So um, we're a late stage uh, startup. Anybody who wants to be involved there as a strategic investor. And of course, any MGAs or, or specialty carriers or other carriers that are looking to utilize our, our innovative technology to, to modernize their systems. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. So for those of you who have been following intensely the order of companies, we're actually moving the next company, uh, Quantum Merge, to Section 4. So stay tuned. Um, like I said, companies that cover kind of applications to both life and health and PNC um, will be in Section 4. But going back to our theme that starts to emerge, which is what if the worst case scenario happens? Um, I'm going to call up our next uh, company, Single Key, Villar, who's going to be presenting what if the worst case scenario happens and you're a landlord. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Villar, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Single Key, and I'm here today with uh, my partner and uh, CEO, Dan Kostruba. Uh, and we're here to talk to you guys today about how Single Key helps take the risk out of renting for small mom and pop residential uh, uh, landlords and investors. Now, before I get into this, uh, just a quick show of hands. Has, does anybody here have any experience renting, you know, rental units to tenants? Okay, well, there you go. That's it. And, and this shows you kind of how common uh, of an investment vehicle real estate investment has become for a lot of retail investors as a way to build wealth and, and plan for retirement. The challenge a lot of these lenders have, though, is that they're not potentially professionals, prop, professional property managers. They don't have the experience of, of kind of doing this for a living. So, uh, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges you have or, or kind of what, what worries you as a landlord is dealing with tenants that don't pay rent or, or, or damage your property. Now, this is a problem that can be very costly given that the time to evict or to actually go through the legal process of removing one of these tenants can take up to six to eight months in a lot of jurisdictions. So as a landlord, you lose about six months of rent, you incur some legal fees and property damages, easily adding up to fifteen dollars or $20,000 in, in lost rental income and other costs. And currently, we're the only solution in the market that has a great kind of uh, way of mitigating this problem. We, uh, we start with our tenant screen report. This is Canada's number one tenant screen report, 10,000 reports by volume on a monthly basis. It gives you all the data that you need to make a good decision on the tenant before you put them on the lease and reduces the risk up front. We then collect rent and report it to the bureaus to incentivize tenants to pay the rent on time to build their credit. And thirdly, we then guarantee the rent through our uh, insurance-like product where we take 5% of the monthly rent from the landlord and in exchange, we guarantee up to 12 months of lost rental income in case of tenant default. We cover legal fees uh, as part of the uh, uh, legal process as well as cover damages to the unit for up to $10,000 in case of any vandalism or malicious damage. So the value proposition here is very strong. We make sure that you get your rent check no matter what. And if there's any problems with the tenant, we'll step in to support you from the legal side as well. So you can have complete peace of mind as a, as a residential investor. Now, we, as I mentioned, a lot of the value proposition now is on the landlord side. 
but these guys, the landlords are bringing about 10,000 uh, tenants a month onto our platform for free. So we're thinking of ways to actually add value to that side of the experience as well. We started off with renter's insurance as our first pilot. We're currently selling about 200 policies a month and scaling up from there very quickly. Um, here's what the economics look like on the, on the product. The rent guarantee is obviously our money maker here at, at about $3,000 LTV uh, uh, per, per, per customer. We have a 45% risk-free margin after we pay all underwriting costs and, and, and you know, cover the loss ratio. In terms of acquiring customers, the, the two primary ways are uh, first, uh, uh, through going after uh, vacancy terms on Google, we find that, hey, if you go after tenant credit check, tenant background check, rental application, stuff like that, you get a lot of traffic. You get people to buy our, our report, which is a $25 purchase. It's a, it's a great way to get our foot in the door at a low cost of about $20 cost per acquisition. And then we upsell to the rent guarantee program when you have about a 10% success rate from those that buy the report to those that upgrade the rent guarantee. They'll receive our pre-approval offers. Hey, your tenant's are pre-approved for a rent guarantee. Click here to sign up. And it's a great way to also manage our risk and educate the customer once they're in our, in our, in our ecosystem. Now, we've been able to actually grow very cost efficiently by doing this. Uh, we were able to actually bootstrap to the first million dollars in revenue. Uh, we raised a small uh, uh, seed round uh, in January this year. Since then, we've tripled our revenue. We're up to about $200,000 a month, uh, getting close to about half a million users on the platform as well. And we plan to continue growing at this pace and, and triple again next year uh, to reach $10 million in, in uh, ARR. We're going after a massive market, uh, even though we're focused on the SMBs, small landlords, one to 10 units. These guys own about 60 to 70% of the rental market or rental stock in the US and Canada. Um, and the reason we're focused on these guys is because that's where the competition is not. You know, you're looking at Rhino, Jetty, Lease Lock, Guarantors, everybody here is focused, after, is focused on B2B, apartment operators, multifamily and REITs, because that's the easier path to market. But we are the, of the opinion that the small guys are the ones that really need us. The, they don't have the scale to be able to actually uh, absorb the, the cost of tenant delinquency. They need that rent check to pay their mortgage payments and property expenses. So we can add a lot more value. Plus, they don't have the paralegals. They don't have the property managers, the, the superintendents in the building to help deal with uh, 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 tenant delinquency issues. So we can add a lot more value. We can, we can charge a higher price and we have a much bigger market to go after. We've got an awesome team to really go after this opportunity. My background is in consumer risk uh, uh, and uh, uh, engineering. Mike's the CTO at uh, uh, ScreenFluence and Storm Homeworks. He exited that company before he joined us. And Dan is a, was a prior operator with a real estate experience as well. And COVID, this was a big kind of accelerant to our business. Uh, during COVID, as you guys know, there was eviction more terms in every, every uh, jurisdiction. A lot of landlords went over a year without getting a rent check from tenants. Some of them had to sell their properties. So it really highlighted the, the magnitude of the problem that we're solving. And now as we're going to a bit more of a recessionary environment, the same fears come up where, hey, will the tenants lose their job? Will they be able to pay the rent? So we think that we're going to see a big kind of wave of demand kind of coming our way. Now, what do we need? We need two things. First, we need uh, underwriting in the U.S. Currently, we're Canada-based, so we offer the rent guarantee across the Canada, and it's doing really well. We'd like to bring that program down to the States, and we're, we're looking for a partner to work with. And secondly, we're looking for a $10 million uh, investment to, to really help scale up this program across the U.S. Thank you for your time, and uh, I'll be in the, in the hall. Thanks, Viller. So continuing our theme on uh, what ifs. So what if you happen to own a house in Tornado Alley in Wichita, Kansas, and that tornado happened to hit your property? Wesley's going to come up from Sola and tell you a little bit more about parametric wind damage. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wesley Pergament, and I'm the CEO of Sola. We are changing the future of catastrophic claims through a supplemental add-on policy that helps homeowners and small businesses pay for immediate expenses, help them cover their deductible. Um, so our team, I previously worked at a flood insurance startup uh, where I uh, worked on FEMA disaster maps and became acutely aware of the protection gap after natural disasters. Um, the rest of my team also comes from startup project management and engineering backgrounds uh, with advisors with decades of uh, industry experience. Um, so what's the problem? The claims process is extremely inefficient. There are a lot of players involved, from the reinsurance to the insurance carrier uh, who's, the, uh, who's the policy under, to the agent who has the relationship with the homeowner, um, and then to the claim filed uh, with the FNOL process, uh, or first notice of loss, and then ultimately the adjuster who needs to visit a property many times, go back and forth, um, and let alone not even accounting for the fact if there are uh, 
if they're not getting the proper payment that they need. Um, and then ultimately, there's the settlement. Um, so this leads to a huge operational time cost uh, for insurance, um, ultimately also an inefficient and uh, lack of transparent process uh, for the homeowner receiving the claim. Um, and as a result of that, least these, least this leads to homeowners uh, not receiving the payout that they need in a timely fashion. Um, so as a claim victim, uh, what does this mean? It means that they're not able to get the money that they need to recover, uh, ultimately leading to a distrust in the claims process. Um, and more people than ever are worried about natural catastrophes. So this is a huge market. Uh, this is a $200 billion opportunity in uh, catastrophic insurance in property and casualty. Uh, right now, we're starting within the tornado space, but we'll ultimately uh, be launching our wind and hail product and growing into other natural disasters, as well as increasing our limits to also uh, serve larger commercial properties. Uh, so the claims process was inefficient, and as a result, we fixed it. Uh, so what we're doing is we're working directly with reinsurance providers out of Lloyd's of London um, and through National Weather Service data and our proprietary software, uh, delivering payouts directly to homeowners and small businesses within a few days of the loss. Rather than having that long process, we're able to know exactly where the damaged areas are and based off that information, pay out exactly who we need. So how it works, we took 70 years of NOAA data and over 100,000 tornadoes to build our actuarial uh, models. So rather than coming up with this correlation of what the damage could be in a certain area, you can give us 2017 Alabama, for example, and we'll tell you exactly what the losses would have been because we have capped payouts. They're meant to cover that gap in insurance. Um, and so from this data, we can then figure out uh, exactly where these damaged areas are to provide a payout uh, directly to homeowners and small businesses uh, into their account within a few days. Um, so our first product is a tornado add-on that uses National Weather Service data, um, and it's a $70 add-on. Uh, and so this is uh, meant to cover up to $15,000 for the homeowner, uh, though it can be, uh, uh, the limits can be changed to cover just the deductible, um, ultimately up to the agent to decide how they want to sell it. Um, so we're partnering with uh, insurance carriers as well as uh, independent agencies and aggregators to sell this as an add-on to the main HO3 or BOP policy. Um, and so our traction so far, uh, we built all the technology out uh, for our Tornado product. Uh, we have our reinsurance partner, Beasley, out of Lloyd's of London secured. Uh, we're also working with Spinnaker as a fronting carrier. Um, and we've also uh, have uh, five deals with enterprise brokers, uh, Insurica, Appalachian Underwriters, uh, Bolt, uh, Madison Independent Agency Network, just to name a few. And we're looking to bring on a few more before the end of the year to scale up um, our Tornado policy. Uh, so ultimately, this is a, a large market um, with, a, with a white space. So as I'm sure we all know, the insurance industry is very segmented. Um, and so we're taking all aspects of the, the reinsurance, the claims, and the advanced weather technology to put it all into one product uh, to help close that gap uh, for uh, small businesses and homeowners. Um, so our timeline, as I said, we secure that reinsurance and fronting. Uh, we'll be launching our Tornado product in quarter one, um, and we're also developing the Wind and Hail product uh, through the Lloyd's Lab program uh, that we're also actually participating in um, at this moment. Uh, so ultimately, our vision uh, is to change the future of catastrophic claims. We're not just a tornado insurance company. Uh, we're going after the entire catastrophic insurance market to rethink how uh, homeowners and small businesses and, and commercial, uh, commercial entities deal uh, with catastrophic events to get the money that they need um, within a few days uh, after the event uh, to recover faster. Thank you. Thanks, Wesley. So continuing our theme on what if, I know a number of you end up purchasing things online. And something that's always perplexing to me is, is that Amazon Prime check mean that it's actually provided by Amazon or somebody else? Well, Sherbrite's here to help protect you if you end up buying something that was maybe not protected in the way that you thought to be actually secured with a warranty. I'm gonna bring up Steve and Kai to share their story. Great, thank you, David. Um, I'll be brief, I'm in day two with Sherbrite, and the reason that I'm here as a Chief Revenue Officer is to introduce the co-founder, Kai, uh, and to show an example of a company that went through InsureTech New York, who's deployed a growth model. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, about 10 years in founder experience. I came from a VP role at UiPath, which is Robotics Process Automation, founded on Park Ave right down the, down the street. Um, so I'm excited to bring that corporate experience back in the startup world and introduce Kai, our co-founder here at Sherbrite. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, you still have the job, by the way. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. My name is Kai. I'm the co-founder of uh, Shortride. We are building an embedded insurance as service platform for everyone. So if you have ever bought anything at a Best Buy, or if you haven't, there's actually one across the street if you want to do your due diligence of the day. Um, at the checkout, you always find out that Best Buy try their best to sell you extended warranty or insurance plan. So we actually looked into the 2021 financial statement of Best Buy and was shocked to find that over half of the net income come from warranties. So this is a highly lucrative product, but today 60% of the online products that are being sold don't have a warranty or insurance attached to them. And that's the case for a lot of reasons. 99% of the small businesses in commerce uh, e-commerce e uh, e in North America cannot provide that. First, they have a very hard requirement to meet for the insurance premi premium. Uh, a typical uh, merchants need at least $3 million of insurance pre premium for e insurance company to even consider them. You also need to dedicate a tech team, operations, compliance team to uh, launch the project. And it takes at least six months to actually integrate tech be between the insurer and the merchant. So that's what we're doing. We're building a Shorebrite that is an insurance as a service platform that enable any business to start selling highly profitable insurance within one hour. In the days right now, we can go on Shopify and start uh, creating a store within five minutes. We're doing that exact same thing for the insurance. So exactly how does it work? Uh, I'm not going to bore you with those uh, uh, curly graphs, but we actually have a demo that I can walk you through. So let's say I am a Shopify owner, and as I mentioned, right now you go on Shopify, spend five minutes, you can actually start selling furnitures or appliances on your own. So what you do is you can open our Shopify uh, app. So this is our app, Extended Warranty by Shorebrite. All you have to do is literally click on or off of the products that you want to sell insurance or external warranties on. In the back end, we have already read all the products they are selling in your store and match them with the insurance policies that we have partnered with our insurance companies. So, we empower insurance companies as well by a lot of categories. First, we help you guys distribute easily. We only have two simple APIs that the merchants and our customers can use to call and to transmit the sales data to us. We can help you distribute on multiple e-commerce platforms, Shopify, Magento, BigCommerce, or even the merchant's own website. We can help you uh, integrate with them. And we're also unlocking new distribution channels that include fintechs, buy now pay later companies, one click checkouts, or neobanks. We fully believe that an API is the future to embed insurance everywhere. It is a very easy integration. Uh, we receive and transmit policies with insurance companies with any, pro any kind of format they have, whether it be SFTP or API. Actually, two weeks ago, one of the insurance partner we had actually asked us to, to transmit through FlatFile. So who knows? Um, and we also provide a great customer service. So we have chatbot, online portal, and a mobile app, app available so that you can provide the InsurTech great customer service without being an InsurTech. Our secret sauce is our product data analytics. So we provide SKU and the product category level analytics so that you can improve your risk models and, uh, and in increase your sales planning. We deliver value across the whole ecosystem, including merchants, insurers, consumers, aggregators, and neobanks. Again, we believe that the future is embedded insurance through API, and we are here to take the market. And it is a huge market. So right now, the top 1% of the external warranty market is $45 billion, occupied by the big box retailers like Best Buy. With our platform, we can in increase that market to $95 billion by targeting the rest of the uh, e-commerce merchants. So that's it. Uh, right now, uh, we have already raised our 3.2 million seed round, and we are looking to connect with more insurance partners to increase our capability. Specifically, we are very interested to learning more about uh, specialty insurance lines, as well as uh, creditor insurance, cardholder insurance, and accident and illness insurance. We believe that our API technology can be used in a variety of, uh, of insurance lines, uh, help insurance companies to distribute uh, products more efficiently. 
Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Thanks, Steve. So the final one in our whole explanation of what ifs is what if someone at your workplace gets injured? You're going to hear more about that from Zenjuries. All right. Um, hey, y'all. I'm Jesse Dantis, and I'm the founder and CEO of Zenjuries and Employers. This is my partner, uh, Joe Hisson. And... Uh, Let's see. So one of the most frustrating definitions for me of all time with insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. You know, it's like, God, I know. I, and I've been in workers' compensation my entire adult life. Uh, I know that's not very sexy. That's the truth. And we have uh, sold thousands of workers' compensation policies. So like a soldier returning from the front lines, I can tell you with authority, that workers' comp sucks. Everybody hates it. They do. It's called a necessary evil. I don't hate it. But uh, I, there's a lot of opportunity in that. There's a, a great deal of friction and frustration. And a lot of it is that it's sold like a commodity. It's sold with property and casualty. And yet it's, it's much more of kind of like a health insurance product. You know, you're talking about a human being. And those human beings vary, uh, even in the same classifications. And so there's a lot of room for fat, fluff, and waste when you're going through the work comp system. And the problem is, as an agent, you know, I was, going to, I was kind of the one that was always held to the fire on that user experience. And so they'd be like, you know, you're the problem. You know, you put me with that crappy carrier, you know, and it's like, oh, no. And so you're always on this chopping block. So anyway, uh, most of that frustration for me, too, came from the fact that I wanted to tell them, you know, you're not so good either. You know, you're going through the system, you're not doing it right, man. And most of the time, it's because they didn't know what to do. You know, they're scared of it. And there's a, I don't know the last time you've seen a commercial uh, from the attorney saying, have you been hurt at work? But they're pretty common where I come from. And a lot of times that just starts it out with a very scary um, set of circumstances for the buyer. And then they don't want to use it because they, they feel like they're damned if they do, damned if they don't, all that kind of stuff. Well, one day, uh, after 20 years of frustration, it, it hit me that, you know what? A lot of this could be automated. You know, the, it's, there's really a choreographed dance that's about to happen, except nobody knows how to do it, you know? And then we get all mad when it looks like a mosh pit when it's going on. So we felt like if we could just automate these steps and help these people, maybe we could get a better result. So we did. And we, we drew up this uh, idea, turned it into a mobile app that helped people know what to do, when to do, how to do, who to do it with, how long they should do it. Because we knew they didn't want any more lunch and learns, they didn't want any more webinars, they just wanted some easy buttons. And if they could just use their thumbs, maybe you could get them to do these things. And so we did that with a lot of prompts and automations. And so on a book of business, we ran a fever of about 54% loss ratio over about five years. We took it to under 10% in less than our first 12 months. So we were like, whoa, whoa was that us? And yeah. So we kicked it forward another 12 months, we held it under 10% and kind of launched what today is Zendries. So how did we do it? And the key to it is just, it has to be so intuitive that anybody can look at the screen and, or get a prompt and know exactly what to do. Because again, if you're trying to educate them, that's just not gonna be sustainable. And by the way, nobody has an extra minute, because I'm already out of time, uh, in their day to do this kind of stuff, right? So it's important to automate it, which we erased lag time reporting, we cut the uh, claim duration in half, Litigation rates are outperforming everybody and our policy retention is incredibly sticky because our clients don't want to go back to the black and white PDF world that they're used to in workers' comp. They like this ecosystem. They like using their phone, not having to be tethered to a computer just to get to a portal and find out what their loss runs say that they don't understand. So our growth has been fantastic. This is kind of a model that we, that we had in the beginning where we helped uh, agencies. And you know, we've grown quite a bit, and now we license uh, as a white label. We can stand alone as a third party. It's literally a plug and play uh, type of application that a carrier can use it on their label or ours. Um, and he, we're here to stand up our own MGA. And the other good news is that we don't need any money. So I'm not sure what we're doing up here, but actually um, the reason we're here is because we know that uh, it takes time for people. We are gonna need money eventually. Uh, we, we raised around last year and we've got two years of runway. So, but we are 
cognizant that institutional investors like to establish relationships. We're happy to establish that relationship so that when we do need the money, you know more about us. So thanks, thanks for that's it. Thanks, Jess and Joe. So now you have the full perspective on all of the what ifs. Uh, so after this presentation, we're going to be rolling into lunch. Uh, so you'll have roughly an hour for lunch. They're setting it up now um, and some networking. And then we'll come back uh, for part three and four. As I mentioned, part three and four is going to be a little more on the life and health side. And then we'll have some companies to actually cover both areas. And um, just like uh, the people that are out there and are baseball fans, there's often times where you need a relief pitcher. And for those who have been part of yesterday's day as well, uh, know that I've been up here a lot. So I want to give you another fresh face. And in the afternoon, I'm going to be introducing Roy Hansraj, who's going to be introducing the next segment of startups for you. So if you haven't met Roy, meet him in the break, and he'll have some dad jokes for you. Thanks.